Okay. In 1888, Britain's Privy Council confirmed in the St. Catherine Millers and Lumber Company case that Aboriginal title is presumed to have survived the change of sovereignty unaffected. And that there was confirmed in Marble. Okay? So they never interfered with our, our sovereignty. Sovereignty comes from our law and connection to country. That's where we get our sovereignty from. Next one. So, defining sovereignty. In the International Court of Justice, ICJ, the Western Sahara case, 1975, Judge Amun referred to Mr. Bayona Bamea, Senior President of the Supreme Court of Zaire, who defined sovereignty by dismissing the materialist concept of terra nullius and, and substitutes a spiritual notion. And he says, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and, and the man who was born therefrom remains attached thereto and must one day return to, the, to, the, to be united with his ancestors. This link is the basis of ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. Right? That's us. That's defining our connection to country. And that's defining our sovereignty under our law and custom. So, the legitimacy of Aboriginal claims. Sovereignty is the ultimate power, authority, jurisdiction over people and territory. No other person, group, tribe or state can tell a sovereign entity, state or a tribe, what to do with its land and or people. A sovereign entity cannot, uh, can decide and administer its own laws, can determine the use of its land and can do pretty much as it pleases free of external influences. And that comes from a, a doctor of law called Dr. Alessandro Palazzon. Yeah? Okay, so that's him. The High Court conclusion in Mabo, number two, 1992, held that the domestic courts cannot deal with the question of sovereignty. And when you read Mabo, Mabo says that. No question of sovereignty, when Aborigines are exercising that sovereign right and exercising their inherent sovereign rights on their land, no municipal, it's not justiciable in any courts in this country. So all we do is assert our sovereignty. They challenge us. We say, no, we're doing it. This is our law. We're doing it under our law and custom. This court does not have jurisdiction. And this year, High Court tells them they can't. Yeah? They have to overturn that decision of Marbo in order for the courts to deal with it. The High Court failed to identify the legal bars that causes them to draw these conclusions. In detail, in short, the sovereignty of a nation state cannot be questioned by another within their own jurisdiction. So, what I'm saying is that okay, Stradbroke Island, Blackfellas, my mob at ULEA, Gumroy, APY, Wiri, when these people assert their own sovereignty and start doing their thing on their land, then there's no other legal jurisdiction that can prevent them from doing it. But we have to be careful here. We have to be careful because we have to make sure that when we tell our people all this here, we don't have people going out breaking the law deliberately. Because let me tell you, they will. Yeah? So we have to be responsible here. We have to be very responsible. Right? And uh, I think... Um, this is something we need to discuss in a minute. Okay. The High Court, and this year, the High Court cannot deal with issues of Aboriginal sovereignty. The High Court cannot deal with the issue of Aboriginal sovereignty within the Australian legal system. Because Mabo made that, held uh, that that was the legal position. Right? So no other court in this country can deal with it. In other words, when we declare our pre existing and continuing sovereignty, in independent declarations, right, UDIs, no Australian court can deny our right to do so. None. Yeah? So we make a declaration of independence and apply our law, courts can't deal with it in this country. They can't stop us. The question of contested sovereignty can only be referred to the United Nations to mediate or the UN will refer the matter to the International Court of Justice as they did in the Western Sahara case in 1975. So the Bedouins of the Western Sahara said, you are interfering with our land, you're cutting us off from our, 
our oasis and you're taking our natural resources. We want you to stop interfering with our law. Yeah? We want you to stop preventing us from going to our country and travelling across the Western Sahara. They complained to the United Nations and they said that Spain was occupying their country. They were occupied by Spain. And so in this 1975 case in the Western Sahara, the International Court advised the Security Council of the United Nations and they drew the conclusion that Spain was in occupation of their territory and they had to get out of the country. Spain did, but then the French were clever and come in. And the only way they made that, they came to that conclusion, when you read that case, is because the Western Sahara people had an agreement with the king of Morocco. And there was, there was a contract between those two. And so they recognised each other. And they recognised each other right. And it was that agreement between the Bedouin of the Western Sahara and the king of Morocco that put them into a category of legitimate, sovereign people occupying their own territory. And they had an agreement between each other. And so Spain interfered with that and Spain had to get out and Spain did leave. Yeah. Okay. Now, Crown does not have an absolute beneficial title. So this is where we come to now us on our land. And I want to show you how the state governments are interfering with the legal process and are denying us natural justice. Right? And we are sitting there watching them do it because we don't know how to fight, them back, fight back. In this year, and this year, this is what, um, in, in the Mabo case, if the lands were desert and uninhabited, truly terra nullius, the Crown would take absolute beneficial title, an allodial title. Now, an allodial title means you own the airspace to outer space above your land, and you own everything right to the centre of the earth. That's your title, as an allodial owner. Yeah? Now, so, I repeat, if the, crown, if the land was desert and uninhabited, truly terrenalis, the crown would take absolute beneficial title, an allodial title, to the land for the reasons given by Stephen C.J. in the Attorney General versus Brown, right, which said there would be no other proprietor but if the land were occupied by indigenous inhabitants and their rights and interests in the land are, were, are recognised by the common law, the radical title which is acquired with the, with the acquisition of sovereignty cannot itself be taken to confer absolute beneficial title to the occupied land. Okay, now, here's where we have to play on the white man's words and understand what that truly means in the white interpretation of their own language. Yeah? So let's go to the next one. Meaning of beneficial. This word first came into the English language in 1494. See, that's how clever we are. We can find out where these white fellows first start using it. Beneficial means of or pertaining to the usufruct of property, enjoying the usufruct. And this later de definition here came in 1844. So, now, so what is the meaning of usufruct? Because this is important, because Mabo uses it, yeah? And Canadian High Court cases uses it as well. So, usufruct came into the English language in 1630. Usufruct means the right of temporary possession, use or enjoyment of the advantages of property belonging to another so far as may be had without causing damage or prejudice to it. Now, the, in 1811, they added this, use, enjoyment, or profitable possession of something. So what does that mean? That means that when that Mabo made a decision about the Crown did not gain beneficial radical title, and the word here is not, they can't use our land. And they're using our land right now illegally in every way possible. Not only that, it's illegal for them to make profit on the land that we own. Now, 
I don't care what anyone says. But you see, Mabo tied him in a knot. And, the, and this is why the media went ballistic when Mabo was handed down. This is why the government went into a tailspin up here uncontrollably. Because they realised that every landlord in this country was absolutely illegal. And every cent that was made on the land that owned by us had to be returned to us. So we would corrupt this country by totally bankrupting it. And every cent made on our land has to be repaid to us. Has to be. Now, you see, a lot of our people don't know what the word beneficial mean. A lot of our people don't know what usufruct mean. And because they don't know it, they're going to go back to Mabo and just have a look at one word that Mabo put in front of beneficial title, radical title. And the word is not. They did not gain. So if they didn't gain it, and the highest court in this country says they didn't gain it, well then why are we sitting on our black butts here and not getting out there and telling them, get off our country? And every, you can stay here, but you now change it so that you pay us every cent that you've making on that land. And we'll let, you, yeah, we'll, let, we'll let you stay there, but now you pay us. Now here's the problem they got. In 1998, when John Howard made that 10 point, you know, that, what do you call it, that 10 point plan and amended the Native Title Act, yeah, with a 10 point plan. What John Howard was advised by a group called Samuel, Sir Samuel Griffiths Society of Lawyers. These are a bunch of experts on constitutional law. They include property lawyers as well. Now, this group of lawyers, they come from all around this country and they're part of a conservative think tank. And what these lawyers advised John Howard in writing was that they analysed what we were doing in the United Nations, because they're following us every step of the way. And when they looked at what, what we're doing in the United Nations, they saw how we are using international law that has been developed by all nation states. And we are entitled to protection of those laws. And we are entitled to the benefits of all of those international laws. And we are entitled to be protected by those laws. So what does this group do to, for John Howard? They write him a letter setting out that thick document saying to John Howard, if Aborigines, if you're not careful, when you make these 10-point plan, these changes to the Native Title Act, if you put in there that the Australian governments, state and federal, own the mineral wealth, when the, if the Aborigines win their argument on their sovereign rights, then you and we in Australia have to repay every cent that we made to those tribes the way we made the money. So they told him, don't do it. Don't always say that the Crown owns it. Okay? Now, so we have to work out who the Crown is. But let's just stick with John Howard for the moment. So John Howard, when he made that 10-point plan, he did not say the Australian government owns it at all. He left it as the Crown owning those mineral rights. All those rights, and they were preserved under the state acts. When they granted land, they preserved all the minerals and the trees and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so this use of frack now is where we have them because you see Aboriginal people have not done their own homework yet to understand what beneficial means and what use of frack means. So now we've got a bit of an idea. We can nut this out in a minute more and flesh it out. We go to the next one. Okay, so our inherent rights. What then are my rights as the rightful owner of our land, our property. The High Court in Mabo failed to address this vital question of who really owns Australia. Mabo never dealt with that. And Mabo de never dealt with that because it wasn't asked in the first question. So Mabo, if you look at some decisions that they made in Mabo, said they couldn't address those issues because it wasn't asked. Because the lawyers didn't put it 
not. They didn't put it up. They were yeah. Okay, next one. Okay, High Court in Marbo, the conundrum. Right? A conundrum is this enormous problem they got. And the High Court recognised and they created a problem. And this here comes from paragraph 28 of the Marbo judgment. In so far, in so far, uh, it is so far too late in the day to contemplate an allodial or other systems of land ownership. So in other words, the High Court was saying, we got no idea how to sort this out. So this is the only thing we can say. Yeah? So this is a coward's way out because the court had no answer. Yeah? And then they go on, land in Australia which has been granted by the Crown is held on a tenure of some kind. So the High Court couldn't even say what kind of land tenure they had. Yeah? The High Court, all them judges sitting up there, could not define how they own the land and what title they have of some kind. And titles acquired under the accepted land law cannot be disturbed. So they're saying, yeah, the well, we don't know what title. It's a location yeah. of title under maritime law. Yeah. What the High Court did here was the High Court said, there's no legitimate way that we got this land. Right? That's why they couldn't find a title. So they said, of some kind. Yeah? And then they said, even though we don't even know what, how that happened, but we're not going to allow anyone to disturb it. <coughs> but you see, Marbo, the law won't sit with that because that's what you called a denial of natural justice. No part. And so it's our step now is to take it and a challenge them on it. Okay, next one. That's the flag. This here. This is my mob, you all right? This is a combination of two things. This is a combination of our law. Every black fellow who's been through ceremony know that sign. Every black fellow. Every lawman know that sign. And they know what it means. This one is taken from our trees, our carved trees and also the pattern that we put on the ground in our ceremonies. It means, basically, the law comes into our people, gets taught amongst our people and stays within our people on that land. Because we are, our law applies to that land, no one else. And these are the ones who learn it. They're the, they're the novices. We call them Uriwan, people who've never been through ceremony. We've got to go through to learn what that law is. Now, this symbol here if you look at all the movies that you ever watched about kings and queens in England and all the things that they've done, if you've watched the Game of Thrones, yeah, and how they fight each other, oh, God. have a look. Don't advertise that. Well, <laughs> I like that. That's, oh, a, that's a good series. God. Anyway, I'm waiting for Khaleesi to take over. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Oh, um, don't take over. Don't Anyway. The, the position basically is, we need to understand this. We truly need to understand this. We need to understand the power that this has. Now, this symbolism, by way of a flag, heralds, heralds means, and it also tells people that when that flag flies, you are on the country of those people who belong to that their symbol and that flag. Now, you see, Australia's created a real problem for themselves. This flag, when it flies in my country, no policeman is allowed to come onto my country without invitation. Nobody is permitted to come anywhere near my country. And if they come onto my country, they're under that flag, they're under that law. That's, what that, that's how powerful that is. When you look at those movies, you see everybody, they always have the flag bearer. If you look at the Americans in the, in the cowboy movies, when they sent in the blue uniform fellas against the Indians, every time that fellow who was carrying that flag was shot or speared or arrow went through his chest, they made sure that someone else picked that flag up and raised it above them. Because yeah? whatever that flag's down, they're nothing. Whatever the flag's up, they are something. Richard. Um, Michael, um, it's at the entrance to my country. Yeah. 
It, it affects all the no, land. No, it, no, it affects the whole of the land. Yeah, it affects the whole of the land. Now, so the importance is just have a look at those movies. Have a look at what they do. Because as soon as a flag falls, a flag bearer, uh, carrier falls, they put someone else in to raise that flag. And no matter how many times you are shot, that person has to hold that flag up. Because the moment that flag falls, you are defeated. You're finished. Yeah? And your power and your reign is finished once the flag falls. So someone has to fly that flag all the time. Now, we don't understand here in Australia because, you see, we never had any of that under our law and custom. We just knew. We knew where the borders were. We knew the line. We knew our boundaries. We didn't have to have a flag to tell us who we were. We respected each other. We knew each other's boundaries. We knew each other's law. And we invited people into country and we gave them, we sent a message stick in our, in our mob. We sent a message stick to invite their mother mob. When they carried that message stick with them, that was their passport across other people's country to come to you, come to your country. And they were not to be interfered with. The same way a passport operates now. Exactly the same way. So we invented passports before, long before them white fellas invented it. Yeah? We had it. So as you can see, we are, we are in a position now where we have to make a decision amongst ourselves. And the decision basically is how do we now apply this?